Hello friends, today let's talk about a topic, posture and concept. Definition, values of good posture, causes and drawbacks of bad posture. So let's start with the introduction. We are a health conscious society today and good posture is a part of it. Good posture means our bones are properly aligned and our muscles, joints and ligaments can work as nature intended. It means our vital organs are in the right position and can function at peak efficiency. Good posture helps contribute to the normal functioning of the nervous system. Without good posture, our overall health and total efficiency may be compromised. Because the long-term effects of poor posture can affect bodily system such as digestion, elimination, breathing, muscles, joints, and ligaments. A person who has poor posture may often get tired or be unable to work efficiently or move properly. So let's talk about the definition of posture. Posture is the attitude assumed by the body either with support during muscular inactivity or by means of the coordinated action of many muscles working to maintain stability or to form an essential basis which is being adapted constantly to the movement which is superimposed upon it. The ideal posture are those assumed to perform an activity in the most efficient manner utilizing the least amount of energy. All activity begins and ends with a posture. The, the relationship between body part can be controlled voluntarily but to do this would require too much concentration. The during normal functioning, one posture and adjustment to postures are automatic and occur quickly. So now let's talk about the classification of posture. The posture can be classified into inactive posture and active posture. In active posture, we have static posture and dynamic posture. The first Talk about the inactive posture. These are attitudes adopted for resting or sleeping as they are most suitable for this purpose when all essential muscular activity required maintaining life is reduced to a minimum. Those posture which makes minimal demands upon the muscle responsible for the maintaining of essential function such as respiration and circulation are preferable. The posture or position used for training, general relaxation, fulfill this condition by allowing freedom for respiratory movements and least possible work for the heart muscles. The next one is active posture. The integrated action of many muscles is required to maintain active posture, which may be either static or dynamic. First comes the static posture. A constant pattern of posture is maintained by the interaction of group of muscles which work more or less statistically to stabilize the joint and in opposition to the gravity or other forces. In the erect posture, they preserve a state of equilibrium. So next comes the dynamic posture. This type of active posture is required to form an efficient basis for movement. The pattern of the movement is constantly modified and adjusted to meet the changing circumstances which arise as a result of demand. So here comes the, the mechanism of posture. The mechanism of posture is by muscles and nervous control. Nervous control we have Postural reflex. In postural reflex, we have the muscle, the eye, the air, and the joint structure. First, the muscles. The intensity and distribution of the muscle work, which is required for both static and dynamic posture, varies considerably with the pattern of posture and the physical characteristic of the individual who assume it. The groups of muscle most frequently employed are those 
which are used to maintain the erect position of the body by working to counteract the effect of gravity. They are consequently known as anti-gravity muscles and their action with regards to joint is usually that of extension. These anti-gravity muscles present certain structural characteristics which enable them to perform their function with efficiency and the minimum of effort. The form of the muscle is multipinnate and fan-shaped as arrangement which signifies powerful action as opposed to the ability to produce a wide range of movement at high speed. Many of the constituent fibers are red, indicating their capability of sustained contraction without fatigue due to their low metabolic rate of action. So next comes the nervous control. Posture are maintained or adapted as a result of neuromuscular coordination. The appropriate muscle being innervated by means of a very complex reflex mechanism. So next comes the, the postural reflex. A reflex is by definition as efferent response to an afferent stimulus. The efferent response in this instance is a motor one, the anti-gravity muscle being the principal effector organ. The afferent stimuli arise from a variety of sources all over the body, the most important receptors being situated in the muscles themselves, the eye and the ear. First comes the, the muscles. The neuromuscular and neurotendinous spindles within the muscles record changing tension. Increased tension causes stimulation and result in the reflex contraction of the muscles and so appear to be a manifestation of the myostatic or stress reflex. The second one is the eye. The visual sensation records any alteration in the position of the body with regards to its surrounding and the eye form one of the receptors for the writing reflex, which enables the head and the body to restore themselves to the erect position from other less usual attitudes. The third one is the air. The stimulation of the receptors of the vestibular nerve results from the movement of fluid contained in the semicircular canal of the internal air. This canal lies in a different plane which is a right angle to both the others and any movement of the head disturbs the fluid they contain and thus no less of the movement and the direction in which it takes place and record it. The fourth one is joint structure. In the weight bearing position, approximation of bones stimulate receptor in joint structure and elicit reflex reaction to maintain the position. The skin sensation also plays a part especially with of the soles of the feet when the body is in standing position. Impulse from all these receptors are conveyed and coordinated in the central nervous system, the chief central involving being the cerebral cortex, the cerebellum, the red nucleus and the vestibular nucleus. So here comes the, the values of good posture. Posture is the position in which we hold our body upright against gravity while standing, sitting or lying down. A good posture keeps bone and joint in the correct alignment so that muscles are being used properly helps decrease the abnormal wearing of joint surface and could result in arthritis. Decreases the stress on the ligament holding the joint of the spine together. Prevents the spine from becoming fixed in abnormal positions. Prevents fatigue because muscles are being used more efficiently, allowing the body to use less energy. Prevents strain or overuse problems prevents backache and muscular pain and contributes to a good appearance. So here comes the, the definition of poor or bad posture. 
the postural dysfunction or poor posture is defined as when our spine is positioned in unnatural position in which the curves are emphasized and this result in the joint muscles and vertebra being in stressful position. This prolonged poor positioning results in the buildup of pressure on these tissues. So next comes the causes of poor posture. The causes of faulty posture can be divided into two categories, one positional and second one structural. Positional causes of poor posture include poor postural habits for whatever reason the individual does not maintain a correct posture. The psychological factor, especially self-esteem, normal developmental and degenerative process, pain leading to muscles guarding and avoidance posture, muscle imbalance, spasm or contracture, joint hypermobility or hypomobility, respiratory conditions, general weakness, excess weight, and loss of proprioception, the ability to perceive the position of our body, over-reliance on passive support from a non-ergonomic shapes, and second one, structural. The structural causes are basically permanent anatomical deformities that may not be amenable to correction by conservative treatments. However, some leg length inequalities and some ankle and foot issues can be corrected conservatively. So here comes the, the treatment of poor posture. Assessment and diagnosis of postural habits. Postural education and training. The manual therapy and soft tissue massage dry needling, postural tapping, electrotherapy, joint mobilization, the corrective exercises and movements to improve flexibility, strength and posture, activity modification advice, advice regarding ergonomic workstation, pilots exercises. So let's talk about the examination of posture. The examination should include the following. First one, observation of the patient as they sit and move about. Second one, spinal alignment. Third one, measurements or estimation of deviation from ideally erect posture using plumb line, the inclinometer, and posture guides. Done in three or all four views. Limb length and good measurement. The flexibility test and joint mobility test. Muscle length and the strength test. So next comes the, the techniques of re-education of posture. The atmosphere in which instruction is given to the patient is of great importance in postural re-education. The patient must be made to feel that any effort he makes to attend it will be noticed and appreciated, while his difficulties and shortcomings will be understood. The techniques of re-education are first one, relaxation, second one, mobility, third one, muscle power, fourth one, stretching, fifth one, presentation of good posture, and last one, the complete picture. So let's talk about the, the relaxation. The ability to relax is an important factor in re-education and some degree of useless and unnecessary tension is nearly always associated with poor posture. To begin with, the general relaxation with the body in horizontal position reduces muscular tension and gives a feeling of alignment. The voluntary relaxation of specific muscle groups can then be taught and practiced so that the patient learn to recognize tension and able to relax at will if and when it develops during the maintenance of either static or dynamic posture. The second one is 
mobility. The maintenance of normal mobility is essential to enable a wide variety of posture to the edge. The abnormal mobility, however, is a liability rather than a threat, as additional muscular effort is required to control it, and in some cases, it may be a contributory factor in the development of poor posture. The normal mobility is maintained by general free exercises which are rhythmical in character and include full range movement of all joints. The emphasis is laid on full extension as this is the movement which is most liable to limitation except in case of lumbar spine and the shoulder where flexion and lateral rotation respectively are more likely to be limited. The exercises and agilities which increase the respiratory excursion are of great importance and should on no account be omitted. And those which involve hanging position give good alignment of the body and are much enjoyed by children. Third one, muscle pull. The general muscular weakness is rare. If so, harmonious muscular development helps to maintain their tone and efficiency and so to withstand any strain which may be imposed by occupational stress. The fourth one is stretching. The shortened agonist muscle must be stretched before the antagonist muscles can be optimally exercised to increase their strength or vice versa. The depending on the condition, manipulation may also be required to release an accompanying joint fixation. Therefore, the manipulation should be added to the list of posture correction therapies. Fifth one, the presentation of a good posture. A mirror, posture recorder or photographs may be useful for this purpose so that the image can be compared with picture of expert which demonstrate a good general pattern of alignment. The video tapes may also be used. This is particularly impressive in training dynamic posture in activities such as tennis, diving and lifting where faulty posture can have such a marked effect on the efficiency of the movement. And last one, the complete picture. If the complete pattern of good posture does not emerge, it must be built up gradually and progressively from complete relaxation. A state of balanced tension and much concentration is required at first, but the effort and tension are progressively reduced by repetition. Provided there is sufficient repetition and precision so that the new pattern of posture becomes habituated and therefore no longer require voluntary control, is it is maintained by a conditional reflex which is part of the postural reflex. So here comes the, the conclusion of today's topic. We often hear that good posture is essential for good health. Normally, we do not consciously maintain normal posture, instead certain muscles do it for us, and we do not even have a thing about it. Good posture help us stand, walk, sit and lie in the position that plays the least strain on supporting muscles and ligaments during movement and weight bearing activities. Whereas, poor posture can lead to excessive strain on our postural muscles when held in certain position for long period of 